Thank you for dreaming, David. Thank you for getting us here. You know, I don't remember the last time I flew in an airplane with my father. Well, actually, it was two days ago. But what was that? <laughs> Sixth time in 20 years or something like that? I never keep count. I don't know how you got him to do this. Um, I think in part, Michael being here was another catalyst. And we had a wonderful time going to uh, one of my favorite art experiences, which was up at the Met, the Rockefeller Wing, with all of the primal art, which has been a huge influence to myself and probably as well, my father as well. Um, it was terrific to share that moment. So I'd also like to thank Canon for sponsoring these things and to everyone at B&H for putting on Optic. Uh, it's a terrific event. Second year? Terrific. I hope this goes for a long time because I can see it's doing a lot of good and uh, it's nice to see you all here today. There's a lot I could say about photography. I'm going to try and keep it simple and it's focus on what motivates me to photograph and I think that's so important. Well, I was doing reviews today and yesterday and one of the first things I always ask is not only is how can I help, but what are your goals? What are you trying to do with photography? Because there are many different types of photography, photographs, many types of photographers, many reasons to make photographs. We don't all have the same. And so what might be useful to one person might not be helpful to another. You really have to figure out what kind of photography you're practicing and what you're trying to do with your photographs. I'm going to share what I try and do with my photographs here. For me, photography is an invitation to look at looking. My work is about the perception of nature and the nature of perception. And I'll get into that more deeply. I think they're deeply involved and it gets into our own self-identity. But I think this is really true, what Proust said, that it's in finding new eyes that the real voyage is, in, in learning how to see in new ways. And that's one of the reasons I picked up the, the camera. This, one of my father's most famous photographs, is one of the reasons I got fascinated by photography. That a small apple could suggest the vast cosmos and their interconnection. That there was metaphor and mystery, that it went beyond the surface of things, that it kept you asking questions, that you could look at it for a long time, for many years, and it kept on giving. All of those things fascinated me, that in a literal recording, all of those things could happen, and it was so much more than just recording light reflecting off of surfaces. So much more, a mystery as to how that happens. This is another photograph that influenced me so much. No, we didn't lose the live feed. Actually, my mom lost the photograph. <laughs> it was a little three by five shot, or at least started out as a negative. You remember those things, negatives? Michael remembers those things, a little negatives. Dad was photographing the megalithic monuments. He got a Guggenheim grant to go and photograph the Irish. Well, he focused on the Irish, but he was looking at the megalithic monuments through the British Isles in particular. I'm a kid. He's getting me to crawl through them and check certain things out because he can't fit. And that was fun, but it takes a little while to make a photograph with a view camera. So mom and I are spending extra time reading Irish fairy tales. And in them, there are these magical creatures. Any black animal is a puka. And the pukas can go in and out of different realms, the different dimensions. They go into the fairy realm. They, there is another level of reality that they move in and out of. And we saw a black cat running across the hedge while we were waiting for dad. And I heard the setter go click, click, click. And we were excited to see the cat. And I'll never forget the amazement on my mom's face as she's going through the three by fives and she can't find the cat. Kind of interesting that somebody who's interested in trying to find ways to make visible the invisible, whether it's a feeling or a memory or a dream or the landscape that we take inside ourselves, that that was one of their earliest, most formative moments. And I often ask people to go back and find what their most formative moments were, that, that moment when photography really became fascinating to you. Often it goes way back and it stays with you for a lifetime. Sometimes those fascinations are, are most important. So, I'm part my father, a photographer, interested in monuments, and part my mother, a painter, who crafts images together, and mostly myself, because they uh, don't have to take credit for all of my missteps. I do. <laughs> both are different ways of seeing, and I've had to train myself to work in both ways of seeing, and I flip in and out, and it's been challenging over the years to move in and out of those different ways of seeing and relating, and they're able to do different things. Photoshop was a dream come true because I could render what was in my mind's eye very clearly. And I remember when I first went to uh, pick up the camera more seriously during my college years, it wasn't until that late, for the most part I was painting a lot. 
we visited Fergus Burke, a friend in Ireland. He said, oh, so you're going into the family business, are you? So who are your influences? <laughs> I said, well, Bosch, Blake, Durer. No, 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 photographers. Oh, well, aside from my father, uh, Jerry Oseman. No, pick another. He doesn't count. <laughs> Can you imagine in this day and age, you know, post Photoshop? One of the things that I'm most interested in is that the camera sees differently and it can extend the way that we see. The camera can freeze quickly moving subjects, hold them still so I can look at them very carefully again and again and over time understand the subject within more detail, more depth. That sustained consideration is quite fascinating, that it can freeze time or extend time. You saw some of that in Michael's work, really beautiful stuff. These days with high ISO cameras, we're often making test shots to see if auroras are coming or what's really in those shadows because you can't see it with the naked eye, but with the exposures on these new cameras, suddenly new information comes to light, for better or worse. Remember, the best thing about photography is that it records so much detail. The worst thing about photography is that it records so much detail. And the big question is what's left in the frame? Is it significant detail? We can all learn to see differently. I've had to train myself both as a photographer and a painter and flip in and on both of those modes, but I've also had to overcome my traditional training. I missed this shot the first time I went to Death Valley because I was thinking in decisive moments that tended to last in 125th of a second. Maybe not for Michael, that might be what, eight hours, 15 hours, if you get locked off the hotel roof? Yeah. I was thinking of a single moment, but what I was really impressed with was this wave of light that comes across the valley floor every morning. It lasts about 45 minutes. In the beginning, it gets this gorgeous coral color in the far mountains, but everything else in the foreground is in deep shade. As the light crawls across the valley floor, it finally reaches Manly Beacon about 20 minutes later. That's that gorgeous crescendo in this symphony of light, but the pink color that was first there was lost. So I made multiple exposures of the same scene and layered them together. It seems to me that all composites tend to involve time travel more than they do relocation. But then again, if you had multiple cameras and you took them all at the same time, yeah, that's what Photoshop does to your head, so enjoy. As the uh, psychologist Piaget says, what we see changes what we know, what we know changes what we see. And I think we're responsible for the ways that we look at and interact with nature. I also have to understand what the audience is likely to bring, and sometimes I'm surprised, it's really quite wonderful to see that different people ask different questions based on what they know. Astronomers look at this, uh, well, let's start with the photographers actually. Photographers look at this, and less and less these days because of the high ISO, they'll ask me, how did you get that exposure? It's low light, it must have been a long exposure. We should have had motion blur, you know, that beautiful mist that we see on the, on the water. How'd you freeze that? Well. I took a clue from Spielberg, I shot by day, and color adjusted to make it look like night. Oh, you cheated. And I have to say there's no such thing in the arts. It's about appropriate means. This image would not be re reproduced, and I wouldn't let it be reproduced in National Geographic or Time Magazine, but in my art show where I'm trying to show the color of night and those beautiful moments and the expressive event, it's absolutely fair game. Why can a painter do it, but a photographer can't? Astronomers, on the other hand, ask me entirely different questions, which most photographers who don't know their constellations don't ask. Where did you find those constellations? Were you in the Southern Hemisphere? I'm, even then, I'm not familiar with them. You're right, I rendered them in Photoshop so that I could make stars that look the way that I saw them with my naked eye, not those hard, multicolored pinpoints of light that photographs bring back. I used Photoshop to try and make it look more the way that I saw it. Oh, very creative. <laughs> different responses. So we do have different responses. I think the questions are more important than the answers, but of course the questions come from a mindset. So very often we have to shift our mind to ask better questions. I was reminded of this, how important not knowing is when I took a tour of one of my shows with the gallery dealer before the doors opened. He wanted to know more about the work. And I came to this image and I paused and I couldn't remember whether I'd photographed the snow or whether I'd rendered it with Photoshop. And I've deliberately not gone back to the file because I want to look at the image and try and figure it out. And in trying to do that, I start looking at snow more carefully and I start looking at other people's photographs of snow more carefully. I've learned a lot more from not knowing and to continue that searching and questioning 
than I have from getting a simple, quick answer and then moving on too quickly. We all say different things. Boy, do we all say different things. I love these symmetrical patterns, these Rorschachs. Uh, they do so much. I, I could go on about this for quite a bit. Let me just tell you three stories. Different people's responses. One evening in a gallery show, a gentleman reeking of scotch and smoke comes up and says, I love your satanic icon. <laughs> I'm looking around the gallery and where? Show me. He leads me to this image. It's not at all what I was thinking or what I felt or it's not even close to what most people see it. Some people see some demonic shapes or other things. But do I have to take responsibility for that? And I ask myself that question. Uh, I let it sit because I often don't share what I was originally thinking or what I'm thinking now and it does change over time. It builds up layers because I want people to hold on to their initial impressions and have their own experience and to continue that interaction. I think work is extended and once you release it out, it takes on another life and each performance, each viewing is a reinvigoration or a, a, a reanimation of the image. A good friend bought this image, brought it home to his wife, said, look, so beautiful. Where should we hang it? You're not hanging that in here. Why not? It's dirty. Can't you see? It's an x-ray of somebody sitting on a toilet. <laughs> My advice, just keep going, just keep going. Only one possible answer. But I like this image most, not only because I've had more stories like that shared, more exciting exchanges, but also because I got one of the greatest compliments I've ever had on my work from a four-year-old boy. When I first exhibited, I happened to be lucky enough to be in the corner of the gallery as he ran across the threshold and stopped and went, ah. And I said, look, success. If you can stop a four-year-old in their tracks, catch their breath, success. I don't care how much it sells for. I don't care how often it's collected. I've touched someone. And then the arms start waving and he starts sputtering. It was the first time I was glad there was glass in front of the print. <laughs> he says, it's, it's, it's a giant sneeze. <laughs> and I'm over here in my corner with my artistic intention thinking, I named the piece Avra, the Sanskrit word for breath, breath, sneeze, close enough. <laughs> I think we have to learn to, li to listen flexibly. But I also think we can learn quite a lot from other people's responses. So we still, to this day in the studio, call this image the giant sneeze. And I, and I thank that young spirit so much. We really see things as we are. The ways that we see or think about the world, our worldview, changes the ways that we look. And the way that we look changes the information that we get back. It's this continual feedback loop. But I think rather than just inheriting our worldview, and our sense of self that comes with that, we can become much more deeply engaged in it and look at how we bring responses, feelings, ideas, thoughts to each viewing, not only when we make our photographs, but when we make others. And that through other photographers, we can learn to see in new ways. This community helps us see in many new ways. So I'm going to shift gears talk about some of the more sublime moments that I've had in landscape, just three, because it's really one of the roots of why I do this and why I go to the places I go, seven continents in the last nine months, some absolutely fabulous places, and these are three of my favorites. Seljansvass in Iceland is this waterfall that you can walk behind. And I visited it many times, and I failed many times. I started, I made the postcards that everybody else made, but I wasn't able to make an image that I felt was really mine. And also didn't have the conditions. I had to return many times to get the right conditions. This is west facing, but in Iceland there's a lot of weather. So to find the clear day at sunset when this thing starts to catch fire as it changes from this gorgeous white to a cream to a rose petal pink to a deep saturated orange and then later into mauve and finally lavenders and grays and then it turns to night. To have the privilege of sitting under that thundering waterfall that like an organ is resonating your chest, almost in silence. It's strange to call one of the louder experiences I've had a silent moment. To watch these continually changing patterns and this very slowly shifting light, almost imperceptible. If you just stay still long enough, you get to see this marvelous transformation, this longer moment. 
And the sitting still allows you to catch so many of those nuances and to extend that magic moment. You know, usually when you're in peak action, peak form, you know, get that peak state of inspiration, it's fleeting. To be able to sustain it longer, to extend it, well, it's something I try and do. In Sausage Namibia, I had the privilege of getting in a helicopter and flying over these 1,500 foot coral dunes, one of the oldest dunes in the world, one of the dune fields in the world, one of the oldest deserts in the world. Absolutely extraordinary. If you ever get a chance to go, this is a magical place. And from the air, absolutely wonderful. A little bit bouncy on this day because we had a dust storm and I thought it would ruin the pictures and in fact it made the pictures as the light just suffused the atmosphere. And to be able to stay in that state of, of wonder really felt like a long moment of extended grace. Again, these are the reasons why I photograph. To go to these magical places, the, the camera of photography, the discipline is, is often a passport as well as a calling to, to go to these places. And I, some time ago, made a bucket list and started to check off all the places I really wanted to go. And I've managed to get to a great many of them. And I strongly recommend you make your own bucket list. There's something about writing it down that makes things happen. Pluno Bay, otherwise known as the Iceberg Graveyard, one of my absolute favorite places on the world. As if Noguchi created sculptures, new sculptures, every day. And you're drifting through these fabulous forms for hours. Absolutely wonderful. I had been looking for calm waters on the windiest continent for a long time. And this February, was able to find an absolutely magical moment where the waters were glassy calm and the only ripples were cast by the zodiac or the pieces of ice that I would throw. I, I do throw a lot of pieces of ice or skip a lot of stones or interact with nature. It's something profoundly meditative. And this was a deeply quiet moment. And very often what I like to do on moments like this and in places like that when I have a captive audience in a Zodiac, my students, is to cut the engines and say, OK, guys, put down the cameras. No more sh clicks for just a few minutes. Let's listen. And you listen to the iceberg slowly cracking. Maybe there's a touch of wind. But often there's just this deep, penetrating silence that connects us all. You can hear yourself breathing. You can hear the people next to you breathing. But there's this deep silence back behind it all. And it doesn't feel empty. It feels really full. And so do you when you have these magical moments. To be able to share that with other people is a real privilege. So that's really why I get into photography, to have those kinds of, of moments. I'm going to finish with uh, five minutes of images, a little bit of music behind that, and some collections of uh, quotes. I'm a big quote collector, because I love these little kernels of, of thought. I'm not much for memorizing three paragraphs or passages of Shakespeare. Steve is much better at that than, than I. But I can remember these little nuggets. And it's the little nuggets that change the way that I think that I like so much, that haiku activity. And so I've paired my images with those, with this notion that we're part of something so much greater. And that if we would acknowledge that we're part of a miracle world, not apart from nature, but apart of nature. And rather than saying, wow, I'm wonderful, sounds a little inflated, we can very humbly say, this is absolutely miraculous. And I'm a part of that. It's a change in consciousness that comes if you think of yourself as not separate from nature, but a part of nature. You start thinking of yourself differently, you start treating it differently, you start treating other people differently. And it's this mind shift that I'm most interested in exploring. So I've collected quotes from many cultures, many times, many traditions, poets, yes, even a politician or two, uh, musicians, spiritual leaders, and I'll let this run as is.
So we really can be the change that we want to be in the world. I love that quote by Gandhi and the one before it, Rumi, let the beauty we love be what we do. It doesn't have to be the giant world out there. Sometimes it can be the world that's really close to us, the world that's in here. That's just as important. This guy has reminded me of that so many times. He's been a huge inspiration, and it's a real pleasure to be able to, to share this with him. Uh, it's already been a great experience, and I know you're in for an absolute treat. Well, thank you, son. For being. for being my son and an inspiration. I consider him to be an inspiration because he's delved into the world of beauty, understood it, and is able to manifest it. I particularly, I hadn't seen it before, but this last bit of presentation where he, uh, he put the audience in a rather quiet place so that they could be with the beauty that existed on the screens. Thanks again. I'm a photographer, they tell me. Been at it for how many years? 55, 50, 60. Anyway, I've been at it a long time. Uh, I don't really know why I started photography. It just appealed to me. My grandmother used to take my picture with a box brownie. And I thought, well, that's a funny little box at the age of five or six. And then I had my portrait taken at a studio once. Big box with a glass eye in it. It was intriguing. And it wasn't until about age 12 that I got my first camera. And the reason I got the camera was that I was not very good in school. I didn't do well with reading, writing, arithmetic. And I was always looking out the window in school, waiting for the bell to ring. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to get outdoors and get into nature. And a few years of that, I realized nature's my teacher. That's my real teacher. Yeah, I have to do this reading, writing, arithmetic, but nature was my teacher. And I wanted to be with her as often as I could during which time nature suggested that I get a camera. Because I enjoyed it so much and I'm learning so much, why not photograph it? And that's when I began to get piqued, my interest got piqued about photography itself, what it was. And not just a, a place of recording, but uh, a place of learning. So I, after several years, realized I could develop this into an art. Didn't have to go to school, didn't have to take a degree in. I simply involved myself in what I love, nature, and then my second teacher became photography. The actual materials, film, developers, I'm still working traditionally, by the way. Um, uh, thank God, I think I'm a little too old uh, an old dog to have to learn new tricks in this new world of digital and photo adobe. My son's doing it. He's doing it beautifully. And I'm glad I don't have to because I want to I wanna spend my last few years with silver. <laughs> so those, are, those first few photographs were my very beginnings back to I think 1950 is when I started using the camera seriously. Now, this is as late as 1957. One of the first photographs I thought, wow, you know, that's pretty good. I wasn't sure why exactly, but it had a certain quality about it that uh, intrigued me. And I thought, you know, if that's art, I want to do more. Minor White, one of my teachers. Ansel Adams was the first real teacher. His uh, system of working photographic materials to get specific results. Good results is all I wanted. Uh, I studied the Ansel Adams' own system and the likes of that. And then 
Mina White, who also taught that system, was more of a philosopher. He was more psychologically oriented. Minor, uh, Ansel loved the great landscape, did it beautifully. Minor wanted to go a little deeper. I don't remember what that was. <laughs> but uh, somebody might call it, you know, something abstract. It's an abstract photograph. Good enough. Oh, God, another abstract. <laughs> of course, you know what it is. And if you don't, you don't have to. It's a, it's a rather pleasing image. Maybe if you need to relate it to art, it's a kind of a cubistic expression of uh, what nature can do. I didn't do this very often, but using infrared film, I noted that it turned, in black and white photography, it turned the green in the landscape to white. And I thought, that, that's intriguing. And I thought, well, don't do too many of those. You'll bore the hell out of everybody. But a few are quite interesting. One of the, uh, in the early days, the zone system was really quite good because you had a, a lot of latitude in the use of the film. How you rendered your early, your dark tones, middle tones, high tones. And in particular, it worked well here because, you know, <coughs> The red goes back, does it? Yeah. It enabled me to drop the background down so that the, the whiter shapes could come forth through the right development in the print and the negative so that those shapes took on a, an abstract form and gave me another world. So I appreciated the zone system for that reason. I don't appreciate the zone system for all the technical information it has in it. I mean, six volumes. Thank you, Ansel. Uh, it, it, uh, it is amazing. It's a wonderful system. I, I use them as uh, textbooks, really, for bits and pieces of information. But the technical side, I put away rather early. Instead of getting involved in technique and gadgeteering and collecting this, that, and the other. It was more, I was more interested in seeing. What do I see and can I render it in my black and white images? Anybody miss the color, by the way? <coughs> no? Good. That was my intention. I rather enjoyed this one, not because it was a nicely sculpted headstone, but the eyes looked back at me, and that kind of was intriguing. So when my photographs look back at me, um, I like the idea. Negative prints, if you've ever played black and white film, made a negative of your negative and printed it, my prints would turn to negative prints. And it does an intriguing thing with light. You know Marcel Duchamp's work, yes? The painter, the photo historians 
always want to refer this to, well, of course, your influence is Marshall Duchamp. I don't even know who he is. Who is he? <laughs> he painted New Descending a Staircase. And I thought, well, okay, I better go look and see. But there was the New Descending Staircase. Still haven't found her yet. short period living in Boston where they were tearing down an entire section and there were some interesting abstract kind of images that were coming from that. Beauty within destruction. Eventually, I began to see that my printing seemed to be the most important part of the photographing. I loved being out in nature, loved photographing it. I enjoyed the fact that the materials themselves took me on as a student. I learned. The materials were my teacher. In the world of tone, tonalities in uh, photography were like my musical interests, I really did want to be a pianist. But uh, the sounds were, the tones in the prints were like sounds that I heard. Another something that comes from nature, in my being with nature, is catching images like this which reflect that which you cannot see. The uh, Sandstone formation, it's a soft rock, has taken on the shape of the waves, which is something that's constantly moving. It doesn't stay still. You don't actually see it. So the wind erosion and the water erosion, the action of it is being reflected in the very shape of the stone itself. So you see the action of nature afterwards. I don't remember this photograph. <laughs> Turn your head 45 degrees left, because that is sideways. It's in the wrong position. That's it. wake up one morning on a winter's day, and look out the window, and what's happened on the window overnight, and the tree behind it, there's a beautiful merging, a kind of an impressionistic. It's taken out of the world of reality. Magical snowstorm left some magical creatures behind sculpted them overnight as it softly fell on the branches. Another action of nature. You don't see it, but the result says nature has been here. There are forces and they are working while you're not, while you're sleeping. Another historian telling me, an art historian, who, of course your influence was Paul Clay. <laughs> Not Duchamp this time, but Paul Clay. And I thought, well, I better find out who Paul Clay is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and there he is.
a little bit of play. I had a painter friend at a studio full of dolls and allowed me to come and photograph. And I had a good time playing with dolls. I find that a very beautiful expression of what plant life does. It seeks the light. It's a nice expression, nice combination of leaves and light together to express that. This one is another experiment with negative printing. I printed that negative as a negative. Spent a couple of days trying to get a good print. It never worked. I took it out of the enlarger and looked at it, and I thought, oh my God, it's a negative image. So I made a negative of the negative and made a negative print. It works beautifully. Another negative print. Well, we had Paul Clay and we had Duchamp, and I just had to make a homage to Vincent van Gogh. Several years back, I did a I had a period of maybe two, three months where I did nothing but photograph sunflowers. Here's one of a pretty straight portrait of a sunflower. This image was, this sunflower was brought to me by a former student and it lived on my kitchen table for a while until I saw that it really was, its very center was like radiating the sun. Here it's being pretty ordinary and just radiating itself. I had a long period of work in Ireland. I photographed stones of all kinds. This is one of the early Celtic Christian stone churches. I did mostly the megaliths, but these churches were, were quite intriguing, beautiful masonry. And light always presents an opportunity to photograph just about anything. So light was another one of my teachers. I have a lot of teachers. It, it keeps me busy. Trying to delve into the spirit of the megalithic culture. This is one of their grand monuments to a period of man's spirit back three to 5,000 years BC. I don't like those dissolves. Oh, I'll uh, push the button.
Both these monuments are known as dolmens, three great uprights with a massive capstone. You can't imagine how they possibly could get them up there. But uh, I, I, I studied them, I stayed with them quite some time and realized it was man's spirit would take great weights and make nothing of it, and just raise stone up to. short period in Japan studying the Buddhist temples and the Shinto shrines, their architecture, always nice in the misty light. for Ansel Adam to take a day off so that I could get a picture of the Yosemite Falls. Never even stepped in his tripod marks. <laughs> Little period in England, this is some of the English landscape. Besides doing the ancient stones over there, I very much enjoyed the, the English and Irish landscape. Great deal of time in nature, loved it. Banging around with a tripod and big five, seven view camera. Some years back, my niece left me. I had to have both of them replaced. Couldn't jump over fences or stones. But it was frustrating not being able to photograph, so I started doing still lifes in the house. always collecting sticks and stones and bones and leaves and they decorate my, my home. So I thought, well, why not photograph them? So I did. known as the Green Man. It seems to tickle you. The Green Man, you know the Green Man? British. British fertility symbol. Another one of those photographs that look back at you. I photographed the peach. That distinct eye was bearing down on me. I thought, Better catch it before it goes. You'll 
never guess what that is. It's my camera ground glass. I sat on it once. <laughs> Couldn't throw it away. <laughs> Offered an awfully nice image. piece of roadkill, I drove by it and thought, oh my, it's a large snapping turtle in the road. And I turned around, went back and picked it up, put it in my car. I thought, it's too beautiful to just leave here. So I put it in my backyard for a day or two and visited it once in a while and finally got a portrait of it. I call it my resurrection photograph. So I don't know if there's time for questions, but you've seen enough pictures. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.